Welcome to the Not So Standard Deviations. This is episode 88, and I'm Roger Peng from the Johns Hopkins Data Science Lab, and I'm here with Hillary Parker of Stitch Fix. In this episode, we're talking about Hillary's trip to the Directions in Statistical Computing Conference, uh, as well as using a diversity of programming languages and changes to the open source software community. Just as a reminder to all of you who um, listen to the podcast that we have a Patreon uh, where we... Um, that we use to support the kind of the production of this podcast, and we would love for you to support us uh, if you can at either the one dollar, two dollar, or three dollar per mu- uh, sorry per episode uh, level. At the one dollar per episode level, you just get our thanks. Um, at the two dollar per episode level, you get both our thanks and a not so standard deviations hex sticker. Uh, and at the three dollar level, you get all of those things. Plus, uh, occasionally we'll post some outtakes from our episodes. Um, so please support us to help us to make this podcast, and we really and we really appreciate those of you have, who have over the years. Uh, so on to the episode. Okay. So do you want to start? Sure. You feeling it? You feeling it? I am. Okay. I'm here. Well, actually, the first thing I wanted to mention, which we have neglected to talk about, is that. We will be appearing at the R Studio conference next oh, week. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's right. I don't know if you do. You remember that? <laughs> I do. I do. I saw JJ Allaire, uh, who's the founder of R Studio, and mentioned it. And he was like, "Oh, right. Are you guys doing a keynote?" <laughs> <laughs> so you, yeah. So you and I will both will be. I guess we'll be doing a joint keynote. Yeah. Uh, at the 2020 R Studio conference, which is in January. Right. And we've obviously made the whole plan. We know exactly what we're going to do. Clearly. Yes. <laughs> I need to research joint keynotes and like, what are the different approaches? Uh, yeah. I, well, I've never done one. And I, I don't think I've ever seen, have you seen one? <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen one. I ha- I've seen one. Yeah. And it was sort of like a tag team. One person presented for a while and then sort of handed it off to the other um, it was like QCon, the QCon I spoke at. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it made sense for them because they were both researching. They did research into organizations. I actually really liked the talk where they were talking about, okay, we've like empirically studied different op- ops teams because it it's like QCon's essentially a DevOps conference. Oh, right. Uh-huh. And um, I mean, it's a software engineering, but a lot of DevOps there. And so they're like, okay, like, what do the best teams look like? And and it was all, I mean, it was all the talking points I like, which is why I liked it, where it's like, oh, like, emotional safety. And like, you know, it doesn't matter. The tools don't matter, but the systems do. And, you know, what are you actually testing for? And it was kind of like all the things we've discussed extensively here of like, you know, don't get into software fights and like, the software choices aren't correlated at all with outcome. So, mm-hmm. yeah. There is another joint keynote that's, that's uh, at this conference, which is going to be Martin Wattenberg and Fernanda Viegas, mm-hmm. uh, who are both at Google. And then the other key, the other two keynotes are going to be Jenny Bryan uh, and JJ Allaire, who are both at our studio. Awesome. Yeah. I'm really excited. It's in San Francisco. That's right. This is my first R Studio Comp, actually. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Get ready. It is. I I have to say, it's a really fun conference. That's what I hear. Yeah. Like I, I don't know what it is about this group. I mean, I think I don't know. I think it. Obviously, you know, my biases are clear if you've listened for a while. That I I really admire this company and how they're cultivating a community and the way that they approach open source and everything. And so I think that is reflected in the vibe of the conference Yeah, where it's super positive. People are really excited to share. Like there's a ton of enthusiasm and just, just really nice. It's hard to explain, but people are nice to each other. (laughs) That's hard to explain. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, are people always nice? No, no, it's, yeah. it's clearly not the case, but absolutely um, not. Yeah. yeah, that's good to know. <laughs> anyway, I'll um, I'll put a link to the conference in the show notes if you wanted. If yeah, people are interested in going. <laughs> yeah, you should go not because we're going. You should go because it's a good conference. I think usually they have diversity scholarships. Yeah, I saw a tweet about that. That maybe they were. I don't know if they're out or if they're coming soon. Or I, I can't remember now. Yeah, um, we'll add that if they're available to be applied for but yeah i think they have quite a few too yeah i think so and so they do a good job with outreach community outreach and everything so yeah Uh, and they have they typically have a ton of uh 
tutorial type stuff. Right. Yeah. There's usually workshops the first two days. And then after that, the conference is two days. Yeah. Do you want to talk about your travels to DSC? Yeah, sure. Um, Last week, I think. Yeah. Last week, I uh, made my way down to the Stanford campus. Long trip. Um, as It actually is kind of a long trip. It is a long trip. Yeah. People think all this stuff is next to each other, right. but it's very much not. Stanford's, cam- man, Stanford's campus is bananas. I, I've never been there. Oh, my God. It's like... Like I was joking, it's like it's like you're in a park that happens to have a few buildings in it. Like it's okay. like it's massive. It's hard to explain how massive it is. You have to cover a lot of ground. Yeah, like literally, I don't know how people navigate. Like you just see hordes of bikes because like how else would you get from one building to another? <laughs> like it's it's weird. It's like it's a very distinct you would recognize it because I don't know, it's like they have these trees and then the trees have these leaves that fall and so it like it's like a very distinct color. And then there's these windy roads that go all through the campus and there's stop signs everywhere. So like to get through the campus, it's like stop and go in this like park. And then you'll like happen upon a cluster of buildings. I don't know. It's just so different than <laughs> like the school I went to or like any sort of East Coast school. It's right. Like, yeah. It is gorgeous. I mean, it's beautiful. Like when you get to the right little cluster of buildings, it's like so gorgeous. But anyway, so point is like I went down the night before thinking, okay, I'm going to save this hour of commute time and like commute at an off hour because if I was going in the morning, it'd be like Chaos. crazy times of like the Bay Area, worst commute possible. Um and so then in the morning I woke up, I was like, every time I, every single time I do this, there's a blue bottle in Palo, like the little Palo Alto, like downtown area. Uh-huh. And so I'm like, I'm just going to stop by blue bottle and then go onto the campus like that. That'll be worth it. And so it's like <laughs> that alone takes me over an hour <laughs> <laughs> just to go to blue bottle. Oh, yeah. No, I wait. <laughs> I had to wait for a car for 15 minutes, which again, it just it's. It's just like a, I didn't expect that because usually when you're in like the heart of like Silicon Valley and you're using an app that is like, it's like built for Silicon Valley. It, anyway, it just, so then I had to wait for that. Then I go to Blue Bottle and of course there's like a long line there. And then <laughs> I had to wait again for another car. And then I had to go through this like sprawling campus like stop go stop go and then i stop i finally like got dropped off and then there's like four buildings i don't know which one it is so i'm like walking around asking people and then people don't know what building it is because it's such a huge campus (laughs) like they're like i don't know it's like literally i asked someone it was like the building next to us and they're like i have no idea (laughs) it's like wow (laughs) okay not their fault but and then it's like even within anyway. So the point is, I don't know if I saved myself much time, but so that's you guys can get a feeling for what it's like to to be at this conference, you right? Know? And how much you sacrifice to go there? Yeah, <laughs> but I didn't sacrifice good coffee. I I made sure that happened. So right. yeah. Anyway, so I, I was invited by Gabe Becker, um, who we've talked about before. He's a friend, and he works. Uh, well, right now he's a he's like a consultant, um, but he is, has deep, deep knowledge of R. He's the one who wrote the alt rep um, update to R core. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, this conference called Directions in Statistical Computing, and like, it, conference is not almost the right word. It's like it's like a small working group. <laughs> it's like maybe thirty. People. Right. Yeah. It used to be kind of a conference but even even back in the old days it was a small conference right yeah i think the idea is that it's like our core gets together and talks about stuff right yeah like what they're gonna do um and then i know gabe wanted to bring in folks who are like using r and get a little bit more perspective around like i think in the past it probably was just like software developers and so they're like well let's get a sense of like what the how r is being used in the world um and it actually was fun. I should give kind of a summary of what I talked about because um, there's a really dynamic person on my team, um, well, on the data platform team named, named uh, Kurt Bolliker, mm-hmm. and he actually has a Wikipedia page. Oh. Yeah. And so he used to, he worked on the Internet Archive. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think he was like the head technical guy for that, which is like a crazy massive amount of work, right? Or just like a difficult technical problem to 
archive the internet. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, uh, but he's like one of these people who's like, he would have a great podcast. Like he's like super talkative and passionate and like just fun to talk to. So I, I scheduled this meeting with him, you know, to be like, give me the rundown. Like, here's kind of my understanding, poke holes in it. Like, where am I right about like our philosophy about R and our philosophy about like how our team is structured. Mm -hmm. um, and it was funny because it was in this room that really looks like a therapist's office okay. where there's like a couch and then a chair. Okay. And I was in the chair and he was on the couch and I was like, oh, our therapy session. And he was like, should we talk about my mom? I was like, yeah. And then he like actually talked about his mom for like 10 minutes. Okay. <laughs> so I learned about his mom and then we started talking about it. So like we only had like a short amount of time, but like we blew through everything because he talked so fast and was so passionate. So um, basically what I talked about was the fact that the flaw, and I've also been reading, I read this Harvard Business Review article I might have talked about, about like nimble leadership. Uh -huh. um, and the idea is that like they went to companies that are really good at innovating and taking, keeping up with the times. And the idea is like, you, you know, it's not, that's not coming from like top down leadership. It comes from like kind of a bottom up entrepreneurial leadership style mm -hmm. where you sort of enable essentially that I would call them the ICs or you just enable people to do the like to like essentially do little startups within your company where you're like coming up with an idea like they they talk about like gore like gore tech I don't know like materials and so it's like you kind of infuse everyone with the company values and like here's what we like to do and here's this type of projects and then people who are on the ground, like are going to have the ideas for like, Hey, what if we like, you know, did a little bit different material engineering and then they go and make it. And then they kind of rally resources and eventually that gets adopted as a project. So we kind of have the same thing as stitch fix, which I've talked about. Like my project is very much one of those things where it was like, kind of get the support, get people bought in, try to rally resources and like get something made and then you have a proof of concept and people are like excited about that. And it sort of snowballs from there. Right. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, I talked about that, how like in talking to Kurt and just knowing how the, the team works, it's like, we will always support R and Python um, and, and Spark, which like, I don't know, Spark SQL and stuff, uh -huh. because those like, they want to have diversity. Like our goal isn't to have everyone streamline into like the world's most reliable production system and not like, cause we want to enable this entrepreneurial like, right. spirit. Right. But that said, there's like limits, like, you know, his qualms were what you would expect where it's like, Oh, we need this to be like, we need R to be administrable by people who don't write R. <laughs> Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like they, you know, it's pretty, pretty rare to have someone who's a platform like ops engineer who like happens to be an expert in R. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like usually the people who administrate R, like R users. Right. Right. Um, okay. And that, I mean, that's like the complaint up and down. If you talk to admin teams who support data scientists, is like, like even the way we install libraries and stuff, it's just, it's, yeah. It's all from within R by design. Yeah, it's not like um, it's not designed as a kind of a modular system like other like Python or something like that. It feels more like, even though packages are modular, it feels more like a kind of um, monolithic system where you do everything from within R. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And again, I think by design. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and like, and I, as a user, I like that because. It's like, I just, I feel like I'm like when I'm in an R console, I'm like at home, you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> and that's just like, okay, yeah, I, this is my safe playground and I can like do whatever I want here. Um, when I'm like in the terminal, I don't have that feeling as much. Right. Yeah. I'm like, oh, scary. I could like do something bad. <laughs> but R doesn't have that kind of like command line uh, interaction uh mode you know that like python does or any other kind of scripting type of right yeah, yeah exactly there's like r command source or what you know like a right, r right. command exactly so i think that what makes it nice for someone like me makes it crummy for someone like kurt bolliker <laughs> right right <laughs> um and so but yeah and like i don't know he kurt's other kind of qualms were like uh 
I think there were things that I think there's like a reputation thing that we're still shaking of like, like, cause I was like, why don't we use like sparkly R or like, you know, spark R whatever. Right. Um, and he was like, oh, well, you know, R really needs to use the conventions of these other languages. And I'm like, I think they do. Like, I don't, I think I get why he would think that like we don't or like we, I mean that that package wouldn't do that, but I actually think that package does that, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah. So, um, so there's still a reputation thing. It's sort of like whenever I'm on a Windows machine and it breaks down, I'm like, ugh, Windows. Right. But <laughs> if you're on a Mac, you're like, oh, weird. Why is this right. happening? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so- <laughs> Yeah, I think totally like some of those the early impressions that you develop when you whatever you kind of use they just stick with you forever. It's right. Just, yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking about that because do you know Restoration Hardware? You mean the store? Yeah. Yeah. But like they've like gone through a massive rebranding. Okay. I mean, it started as like another pottery barn. So yeah, for basically. for non US listeners, it's like I don't know if it, it started as like just like cheaper kind of. But it was like a faux old timey like uh, furniture brand, right? Yeah. Um, like you could buy like mimics of old toys and so I don't. Know, it's right. hard to explain, but <laughs> I don't know. I just I happened to grow up and like saw that version of the store a ton, and then now they've like complete. They're like a luxury, really, like home furnishing. Yeah, like they're they're like very high end now. I guess I have been to one recently. I haven't been in the furniture market for a while. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I just, I got their like catalog and I was reading the, the CEO. Cause I was like, wow, interesting. And like, he talked, it, it just, I was, I was already thinking about this, like, wow, they've really changed just even like the aesthetics of the store and everything. And then when I was reading it, the guy was talking about how they like over the last 18 years have like completely pivoted. Um, so, but I still have that reaction of the first store. It sounds right. like you do too. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It can be hard to rebrand is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> you think R needs a rebrand? <laughs> I don't know. So well, I just was there any discussion? Uh, there were. So the there was a few. Um, Bob Rudis was there who does a yeah. lot of like security stuff. So he was presenting kind of similar to me. It was fun, though, because he talked about all the different languages he's used, which was like quite a lot. And he was like, you know, the reason I love R is because you can like you can do anything in R, you know, like there's there is this like kind of playfulness to the language. Right. Yeah. Um. And, and so, and kind of on that theme of you can do anything, it was sort of interesting because I was talking about at Stitch Fix how all of these tools that our data platform team builds for us is usually some sort of wrapper around an open source project. Uh-huh. And then the wrapper, like, essentially takes care of all the admin stuff. So, like, I don't ever have to worry about logging into AWS or, like, any of that kind of interaction because they've built a wrapper tool that makes it easier for me to do that, like, some combination of like VPN and then we have this like command line script that's always running in the background, whatever, like it takes care of it, you know? Yeah. And then the theme from the, our core people was like, and this is what John Chambers was talking about is like the, like we are in rapper world <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and like JJ Lair was there and he talked about reticulate, which is a way of like, running essentially like importing Python functions into R Um, and like that, they were like, this is great. And ideally I was, I was surprised how much John Chambers especially was really focused on the user experience of the language where he was like, ideally no one who is an interactive user of R, like a non uh, package writer they should never actually have to know anything about Python. Like they shouldn't know that Reticulate is running. We should just write wrapper packages. Like we should have every single Python package, you know, that's relevant, some sort of wrapper package around it that uses Reticulate to like access that the Python functionality and do any sort of type, you know, like there's a lot of type conversion stuff you would need to do. But like as an R user, we should be focused on like, a user interface for that package that feels very R-ish. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so it's just, it's wrappers all the way down. Right? Exactly. <laughs> it's going to be. And I, I was like, I guess this isn't new because there's RCP. Like, it seems like with RCPP, that's like. That's kind of, 
the C++ kind of wrapper, yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So it's like already that's like the most used package, right? Right. But, you know, with uh, you have to have the whole Python infrastructure kind of installed, right? Mm -hmm. um, so anything that uses Reticulate, um, like if you're just an average R user and and don't know anything about Python, like I don't know how you would... Unless, like, short of just having an entire Python installation come with this package, right? Um, oh, yeah. You have to... Right, right. You go like library, reticulate, and then you have to import packages. Well, you know, I mean, like if, if you, <laughs> like what would a person do if they just installed R from scratch, right? Mm -hmm. And they wanted to use a, like for example, the Greta package, which does like uh, hierarchical modeling, Bayesian hierarchical modeling, uses mm -hmm. TensorFlow. Right, mm -hmm. and the te and with the TensorFlow R package, <laughs> which uses right. Reticulate, which uses Python, right? Right. Now I don't have to know about that, except for the fact that I need to install Python in order to get this thing to work, right? Right, right. Um, there was discussion of this. Okay. I won't say that I actually know where it landed or anything. <laughs> well, I'm not saying. I just feel like this. I, it's the same with like you know RCPP. I mean, I guess if you're using RCPP, you're not some naive R programmer, you know, because you. You have to know something about C++, right? Well, but like, I never have to... I feel like I don't have to install much in order to use packages that themselves use RCPP, right? I guess that's true, but I guess probably because... Yeah, I'm not sure... I was going to say I would maybe because every computer has like a C... Live, I don't know, runtime or whatever, but mm -hmm. uh, right. I'm not... I'm, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure, but... Um, I mean, I think I think that this discussion happened, and I just didn't pick up the details. Okay. I'm <laughs> not by far like would never claim to be an expert, but the idea of installation was one of the topics. Yeah, yeah. And I agree with you that I mean, I think the desire was like, hey, can you just do library, whatever? I think that now that this is jogging my memory, I do think that JJ said a lot about this. Um, it was very much on the mind of everyone. Um, yeah. And what I learned actually is that the reason Reticulate came to be was because of the TensorFlow package. Ah, uh, okay. Right. It was yeah. like, oh, let's do this with TensorFlow. And then somehow it was like, okay, we have this Reticulate thing. Okay, let's just make it its own package. Like right. people were asking for it. It sounded like he kind of backed into it. And now, I mean, for me personally, this is a game changer. I was telling my coworker yesterday that like, it's just there's something about like R is such a like R is my happy place, right? <laughs> and so even if I'm like learning like if I'm learning a new package, it's just like if I am using the reticulate version in R, I I can learn what's happening with it versus if I'm in Python, there's like so much clutter of like me not understanding Python deeply that is like interferes with me learning the package itself right. and so i'm just so much happier to import everything and like okay i don't do dots i do dollar signs and then and, but then i do i totally get what they mean about the wrappers because i do run into major problems with the type conversion stuff and i'm like i'm constantly trying to figure out okay like a python list is like a array or you right. know i'm trying to like figure out those conversions yeah. and that's a problem because like you have to know so many and then you have to know details well um, and that's the point they're like we don't want our people to have to learn details of python right it should be abstracted know. out yeah exactly yeah yeah like i had i just had a problem i have to you have to use a lot of l's <laughs> like you can't <laughs> just say five you have to say five l Oh, because it's like integer versus double or something. Like yeah, that. yeah, it like gets sent over as the double by default. Yeah, so. and yeah. they talked about that too. It was like zero L or so that was one theme, and then the other theme was uh, performance, like that in terms of what the R core folks discussed the day I was there. Uh -huh. um, performance is this big thing that they are their concern, and I totally, I totally see their perspective now is that R gets this reputation of not being performant. But yeah. frequently it's because people are writing code that's not performant, you know, and like writing our code that's not like. Yeah. Optimal. And so and then I think that's their big qualm with the tidyverse and specifically the non-standard evaluation is that it's slow. And so. Right. I think their concern is that people kind of write off the language when it's like, well, actually, like we could show you how to speed this code up and 
it's not that ours not performant. It's just that like the the paradigms you're using are not as performant. Yeah, and I think it's one of those things where which kind of strikes at the heart of the controversy at, with the tidyverse, which is that I think if you're interactively kind of dealing with data, mm-hmm. the whole non-standard evaluation stuff I think doesn't really factor in, mm-hmm. um, and 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 it kind of makes everything easier to use, and I don't think it really affects the performance. Um, but I think once you start, once you cross the line into like programming, and and then these maybe these. Um, these kinds of functions need to be called over and over and over again, then I think the non-standard, I think the non-standard evaluation stuff kind of gets in the way and, yeah. um, and is not really necessary because you're not using these functions interactively anymore. Um, mm-hmm. and, but then the problem is you have to kind of switch out of that mode. And if you're not used to programming in like the traditional kind of base R mode, then it's a bit of a, it's, it might be a bit of a kind of like a shock. Yeah. Um, I think that's Gabe's point in terms of yeah. why learn base R first, because his concern is that you'll adopt, you'll you'll learn thing, you'll be confused about what fundamentals of R are. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> and you won't necessarily be able to like relearn the you know the true R core stuff or like not R core, the true base R stuff. Yeah, yeah. it's ironic because I feel like, or maybe ironic is not the word. Maybe uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what the word is because I feel like R originally went through this whole thing where it just like people thought oh it's too slow you know you need too much it's you know hogs all this memory and it's like not efficient and blah 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 and then there's all this work that went into kind of like dealing with that Mm -hmm. right and then but now we have like a layer on top that's like the universe that kind of brings all that back again in some ways (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's a good point (laughs) but it's always trade-offs right because it comes down to the there's like the usability and then there's like the efficiency right so right it also made me realize, like, um, I think his name's Simon Urbanek. Yeah, yeah. Um, he he's on our core, and he also works at AT and T. And it's like we presented kind of close to each other. Uh, yeah, I was right after him, and it was like two extreme opposite ends of the spectrum in terms <laughs> of data size. Because <laughs> like that was a the theme in my discussion with Kurt prepping is like. At the end of the day, Stitch Fix is all human generated data. Like that's the data that we like yeah. d- use. And like at AT and T, it's the opposite. Like it's all cell tower, cell tower pings and blah blah blah. So he's dealing with like huge, huge data sets, and I'm dealing with like what to him are like charming, bespoke, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> like tiny data, and so. Yeah, like it, it. I mean, it makes sense that I'm not running into the pain that he is, and and I think it's it's better for, you know, someone on our core to be dealing with like this kind of massive data set, right? Like, he's at the, the forefront right. of our data world. But... Yeah, I mean, it's good to have someone on the core team who sees that on a regular basis. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's um. Yeah, he's an interesting guy. I don't know how he... Because he also writes this R Cloud thing, I believe. Yeah. Have you seen that? I've seen it, but I don't... I can't say I know much about it. Yeah, it's sort of like a note... It's like a interactive environment for, like, parallel computing and... Okay. Cloud computing and... It, I mean, it's not unlike our studio server, potentially, but much different. I don't... It's, I, I'm sure he would be like, bah, if he heard me say that. <laughs> It's a much more like, uh, I don't even know how to describe it, but the point is he must be very productive. Like, I don't know how he manages all these different things. (laughs) I think he still, does he still uh, maintain the Mac version of R2, I think? Oh, Um, really? Oh, he, yeah, I think he did. Or he he definitely did. And I think he still does. Yeah. He's smart. He's, he's uh, opinionated. Yeah. He'll speak his mind. He'll tell you what's wrong. (laughs) With your presentation, so, <laughs> I mean, I my presentation wasn't like that because it's like you can't tell, you can't be like Stitch Fix doesn't do that, you right? Know? Right. Yeah. In terms of like him and John Chambers, definitely like had a back and forth, um, but presumably they do this all the time, right? right. Like, so, um, so I want to ask you in the middle of this, you texted me a picture. Uh, yeah, it was like John. So John Chambers, actually, you probably should intro who john chambers is because i realized that so you yeah well so, <laughs> so uh, for those who don't know john chambers uh and others at bell labs back in the 70s created the s language um 
And then that became kind of the inspiration for the R language, even though they're kind of have some, some important design differences. They share the same syntax, so they look very similar. Uh, and then at some point, um, I guess, I don't know if this was always true or it happened later, John Chambers joined the core team um, mm-hmm. for R and has, and he also designed the whole S4 class method system uh, for R uh, and implemented it, I think, too. Nice. So, um, but you sent me uh, like a hand drawn, like note. Yeah. That's I, I love that the the date. There's a date on this note, and it says May sixth, nineteen seventy six. Yep. Um, and at the top it says algorithm interface, and then there's like <laughs> all this stuff here for like I guess the design of the S language. Is that right? Yeah. It's, yeah. He was like, "This is the first time that we wrote down." what we were thinking about like that's, that's just, amazing <laughs> i know he just got up there and was like da, 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 here's a little history and like showed this picture and was describing how it bell lat like the and it's like everything you were saying before it was like people writing fortran and so they had this idea for like an interface to the fortran essentially or right, at least i yeah. think that's yeah yeah and um I wish, man, I wish I could remember all the details of what he said, but he essentially was like, yeah, so we finally like sat down and like wrote out what we thought there should be. And, and this was like the doc, I mean, it was a scan, obviously, but, right? Yeah, <laughs> this was the document that they came up with. And when you look at it, it's like, yeah, that, that makes sense. Like an interface for the <laughs> algorithm that you wrote, like, <laughs> It's hard to describe. There's like a picture. There's like a square with a circle in it, and inside the circle it says A B C. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure what that means, um, but it, it seems awesome. <laughs> yeah. No. It was. Oh, I wish. I wish it had been recorded. Or well, there is a document. I'll see if I can dig it up. That's kind of like the history of the S language, uh-huh. um, where I think it's written by John Chambers or it's written by one of the core people, um, mm-hmm. and um, that describes kind of like how things evolved and uh it was originally s was supposed to be like i think it was an interface to a like a series of fortran libraries that they used basically to do like linear regression and you know Mm -hmm. the usual things uh matrix calculations that kind of stuff so it was a layer uh, kind of on top of the fortran stuff yeah well he described like there was a lot going on with like he started somewhere and then they had a computer but then the computer they had to like get some computer, like some something that was even old for that time. Uh huh. It was like they lost a resource, and they're like, "Well, let's drag this thing out." And then it was like, he was like, "I spent a year just like getting this thing to even run. Like it was like <laughs> bug fixing, but like not, not like the charming bugs. It's like literally, I don't." It, the way he described it, he was just like, yeah, this job was not what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and then I, I guess this was, it sounded like this was at the end of a very frustrating <laughs> chapter of development at, I guess, Bell Labs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. In the heyday of Bell Labs. Yeah. I'll ask Gabe if he has, like a transcript of what every (laughs) word that he said because it was yeah it was just so it was like it was so surprising and charming and it was like oh my god you know i saw someone else i wasn't even going to take a photo because i was like let me just be in the moment right now (laughs) and then i saw someone next to me take a photo and i was like okay i'll take it right (laughs) permission (laughs) created yeah (laughs) yeah well it's great that he was there i I kind of wasn't sure how active he still was but i guess so it seems like pretty active yeah 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 like I said, he and he and Simon had a back and forth about something. I don't remember what. I just remember like getting uncomfortable and then realizing that it, it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's just what they do. Yeah, like I because it's just it's kind of startling to see someone challenging like one of these like fathers of the field, you right? Know? Yeah, <laughs> uh, and like Simon's much younger, right? So yeah, it's like, it's like who's this upstart? Like, but I think that they have done this before, so. Any other thoughts from the meeting? I mean, it was just, it was fun. Like, it was cool. And, and again, this world of the rappers is like, I'm into it, you know? Yeah. One thing about the rappers, though, to me, like, it it kind of, it feels very kind of anti-Unix. And which is, I'm not saying that's good or bad. It's just kind of like, it's interesting to think about because I feel like the, the traditional Unix philosophy is like one thing, it's like stringing lots of things together, right? 
Um, mm-hmm. And whereas I feel like this approach is basically like, let's pretend like this other thing doesn't exist and we'll just like wrap it. And so that you never have to like know about it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I can and, see that. Uh, which is obviously have, has, has its advantages, but it's, it feels like a very, um, I don't know to what extent you want to, uh, to, I mean, I think on the one hand you want to protect people from having to know like 16 different languages. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you're kind of, you may be, you're sacrificing kind of, some, maybe some qualities of that other thing by not knowing anything about it, right? Um, right. And so there may be advantages, although it may be practically impossible, to kind of know what the different things are and be able to string them together or interact with them explicitly mm-hmm. than to say, Let's, I'm, just, I'm only going to use this wrapper and whatever this wrapper can do is what I can do, right? I can see that, yeah. It's actually, it's just kind of funny because yesterday we were learning a new tool that our platform team developed that is itself a wrapper for Airflow. Uh-huh. Um, and like one of the people on our team was embedded with the data platform team for a few months. And so he kept being like, they don't want you to know about this, but if you go to the Airflow UI, this will happen. Like, right. <laughs> I was like, I was like, you're like actively undermining. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but so it was exactly what you're describing where it was kind of like, don't look at the man behind the curtain. Right, you know? right, yeah. Um, but then, I mean, I think the the, the guy on our team just kind of disagreed with some of those calls. You know, he was like, "No, it's useful." Right. Um, so, <laughs> but I like. I mean, I think the philosophy of the rappers is that it's it's this idea that you're decoupling compute from the UI. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so it's like. All of a sudden, there's an intense focus on language UI, like that, the programmer UI, essentially. Yeah. Um, and then it's like, what's actually running things? Everyone seems to agree that should be a black box. Like, you shouldn't have to worry about parallelizing. You shouldn't have to right. worry about what's calling what. Like, right. We'll figure it out. And I think it does support this, like, organic... Like, it's almost like that entrepreneurial model where it's like, you know, anyone can come up with a package and just like write in what you want. And then we'll do all the duct tape needed to like get it into all the different systems. Right. Yeah. You raise, I want to go back to, you mentioned the, at Stitch Fix, you have these kind of diversity of languages. So you use Python and R and you kind of want to keep them both. Um, and uh, which I think is, is interesting because I feel like a lot of places, you know, want to standardize as much as possible on whatever language. Mm-hmm. And um, I guess the, you know there's different goals that you're kind of trying to achieve, right? I think right, with, yeah. And you said like you're trying to kind of allow for kind of creativity and and kind of new ideas to kind of spring up as part yes. of having like a diversity of languages, and as well as a diversity of like other things too, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and because uh, I, I I was thinking I was just well, this relates to some email that we recently got, uh, and also an experience that I had. I was at a company. I was visiting a company. Uh, a couple of months ago and they were telling me that they had like a that the company had like a big kind of debate over like whether they should be using r or python um and they just and they at some point they just decided they're just going to use python right uh, and so everyone just kind of had to like standardize on that plus i mean a bunch of other languages too but uh, in terms of this type of language um mm-hmm. and i think for them it was more like it just streamlines the workflow and it and and it also it it um what's the word? it simplifies the maintenance. So if someone leaves, and like they're an R expert, and then nobody else knows R, that nobody can maintain their code, right? Right. Um, yeah. And so um so it simplified the maintenance and reg- with respect to kind of the transition of developers from one project to another. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, but so that leads me to an email that we got. Uh, this is from Rachel, who is a starting at a company, and she is an R. Per, R, per, like an R, she, her, her background is an R, but everyone at the company is kind of like in the Python world. Uh, software engineers, machine learning engineers, um, and they kind of come from a Java slash Python background. Um, and so she's wondering, what do you do in that situation? Do you like try to evangelize R since you're like the one person who knows it uh, to like teach everyone you know, how, how it works and how to use it? Or do you just like you know, do every, convert everything you do into Python and just kind of go with the flow. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I guess I would wonder what her job, what her job is. I guess like data scientist. Uh, yeah. Uh, but it's probably, I'm guessing it's a small place. They don't have a lot of people. Um, and mm-hmm. her, her background is an R. So. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, I don't, well, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have the one true answer. Yeah. 
I mean, I try, but <laughs> not for this. My feeling in this, just from the sense, it's a long email, so I, I didn't read the whole thing, but um, is that I, if you walk into a place and you're the one person who knows R, and maybe it's a small company, and everyone else seems to be working with Python, um, there's a sense in which you kind of have to, I don't know, fit into fit into the workflow, I guess? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely like you will pay social capital to be the person using the weird tool. And and it, and it's a question of kind of like how long term how much of a long term investment are you do you want to make at this point like if you're just starting out. Mm-hmm. Um and because it's not like tomorrow everyone's going to be like, "Oh yeah, R is really cool." You know, um and so it is a bit of a long term thing and maybe you don't want to do that when you first arrive. <laughs> yeah. But also, but if she's sufficiently like like, I don't care what people on other teams write their code in. You know what I mean? Like, if if she's, like, a data analyst type, then I would say go for it with R. Like, if, if other people in her function are using Excel or Tableau or something, then who cares? But if she's expected to, like, write production code that would be used alongside this, like, Python code, then I would say don't do that. <laughs> Like, I already feel annoying for our team because I'm like, like, in all hands, they'll be talking about like, hey, here's our our new like kind of airflow wrapper tool. And I'll be like, hands up, like, are you guys going to make an R (laughs) like workflow? Yeah. yeah. Like they're they're like, we're going to make different tasks for this. And at first, like they were kind of like hedging on the R thing. They're like, no, no, no. Like, and I was like, okay, but like, I will quit if you don't. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I won't actually quit if they don't. But it's just like, I mean, it, it was like scary because I'm like, listen, you're talking about cutting my productivity in half at least. Right. Like, yeah. I'm like highly fluent in this language. And so I don't know if this was a switch since that conversation because like now they're like, of course, we'll always support R. And I'm like, that's good to know. So I don't know if they like decided on this diversity thing. But I mean, Kurt was very explicit. And I think this is true that like, we sacrifice on um, maintainability of pipelines and reliability of pipelines by supporting diversity. So right. like, there is a trade off there. There is a trade off. We made the call that we want to be able to hire whoever we want to be able to support whoever. And so we want to support within reason, like all of these packages, like we don't have like a Julia task, you know? Right. Um, so too bad. <laughs> but, <laughs> so if you're like a Julia expert, you would be, you know this woman <laughs> coming in like stomping your feet like make us there's another issue that she raised at the end of her email which is that like you know if you're even if it's everything's fine even from a policy perspective like you can use r and other people use python or whatever if there is a special case which is that if you're the only one mm-hmm. um then i think there's a there's a danger of just kind of being isolated right yeah uh just because you know there's no one to talk to about oh if you have a problem with this r package or whatever you know like there's nobody there's gonna be nobody to talk to mm-hmm. um and so your kind of community within your job is going to be you know you yourself and you right so totally yeah and so there's that's not like a language specific issue it's just a it's more of just kind of like a what's the word like a social type of you know fa- consideration i guess yeah i i mean yeah i agree with that so and <sighs> yeah i mean i guess like what i'm thinking about is the bob rudis guy because i mean this is someone who's used like every freaking language out there basically uh-huh. and so it's like careers are long and it's not like this one job is going to define what you write in for the rest of time and i do think it's better like i talk about like i have deep expertise in one language and like working knowledge of others but like i probably would be better off if i had more fluency in python etc i mean for sure especially with python right um so i don't think i mean i kind of agree with hadley's thing of like you should get like it's better to become an expert in one than like a dilettante in every language out there (laughs) but it's probably better for most people's careers to have fairly decent knowledge of a bunch and then like hopefully choose one that you want to go deeper on and then like bob was talking about how now i mean now he's like this manager 
And so he can kind of like set the tone. Like you get to a point in your career where you can make those like explicit choices, you know? Right. And, and also once you get to the manager level, you're writing so many reports and stuff that like you, <laughs> you can just, uh, like you can, multiple people talked about using R just for kind of almost like HR type stuff, of uh-huh. like tracking people's hours or like, <laughs> 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 so, but like, I don't know, there's, yeah, I guess it's like, if you're, if you're younger, you're just starting out, you come in, you're like, no, I want to use this other language. Like probably like the older folks of the company are like, oh, this upstart, you know, like, like, <laughs> like versus if you're older, it's like, oh, okay, this person has an opinion from their years of experience. Like, right. You see what I mean? Yeah, um, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, again, I definitely play, pay social capital. Like it, it is very clear to people because I'm an expert in R, like the type of work I do at Stitch Fix versus right. the people who are really expert in like, TensorFlow type stuff, or we don't we don't use TensorFlow, but like similar, you know, like there's a lot of people who use this like PyTorch package, which I just learned. There's an R Torch. Okay. <laughs> I guess I probably shouldn't say it. it's like a little bit of a like like a side project or something. But I was okay. like, yay! I can <laughs> <laughs> like everyone else is writing PyTorch, and I can write or R Torch. But anyway, the point is like. Uh, I don't know. I'm just going off. Now. There doesn't have to be a point. It's okay. There's no point. Yeah. I mean, Simon Urbanak uses R for like AT and T stuff. So right, yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's not. Yeah, so it's not so much a question of is R capable of doing this or not. Right. I think it's more like there are two languages that are capable of doing this, <laughs> and <laughs> which one are which quote you know which one are we going to use? Like right. Um, I think that's a question that a lot of companies probably ask and. Uh, and it's just like, you know, if you're going to choose one, someone, you know, one group is not going to, you know, quote, win out, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Yeah. So, And I think I wish more places made the choice to fix it of like, well, if we want to maximize like hiring or I mean, I just I, I mean, I do. I feel very lucky that I'm in a workplace where they have this sort of entrepreneurial model so that it. It basically means that I'm like highly supported in everything I do. Yeah. 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 Cause it's like, okay, yeah, you want that? We'll enable it. And like, you have a random idea, like, go for it. Like, it, it's a, it's a great, I mean, it's, it's a great workplace for data science. So, yeah. I'm not, you know, to, now that I hear you say this, I'm not sure that everyone thinks of, uh, you know, supporting multiple languages as opening the doors for hiring. A wider range of people like mm-hmm. you know what i mean like i think um i think they my guess is that you know they look at their requirements um and and then just condition on that and then just hire whoever can fit them you know it's like yeah um and so and i think i don't know so i think I, not that i have a lot of experience working at companies <laughs> 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 last one i worked at i think it was like in 1997 but uh um, <laughs> It's, I don't know. That's just my sense, I guess. I mean, they definitely will learn it quickly after if they don't. Yeah. Well, I guess, though, if you just literally write in the job rec, like, must know Python, not R. (laughs) 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 Like, you won't even get people applying. But, like, I mean, I agree with you that usually if you haven't ever hired before, you would be like, it's like this, like, problem that everyone has with languages where they think it's all about like the software and the technical specs. And yeah. it's like, that's actually not it. Like there's all these other contexts that actually reminds me of the other topic we wanted to get to, but uh, should we get to it? Yeah. Let's get to it briefly at the end. Okay. I mean, so someone made that comment to me because I was, I was sort of was, <laughs> I was musing on the fact that, so Richard Stallman has, I don't know, been fired. He resigned from MIT. Yeah. Because he was saying he was like essentially supporting Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah, it was. Which whole... is like I don't some ugly things that were always there. Apparently, like like people in the know, people who knew him or were like closer to him, like in the sphere of influence of him, like basically knew he was a creep. <laughs> and now more people know he's a creep, and yeah. he had to resign. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he had stuff like. Oh. 
well, whatever. I don't even want to say it. He had things like on his website yeah. that were like horrible. <laughs> yes, his website is uh, anyway. But um, <laughs> you tweeted about this a couple weeks ago. Yeah, I was just wondering because it's for me. I realized for me, it's like there's there's like me liking R and me being into open source, and then there's like kind of the like open source political like vigilante movement. I don't even know what to call it. And I feel really removed from that latter one. And I feel like Richard Solomon was sort of in this, the latter group of like, it's like ideology and whatever. Yeah. It's kind of like a libertarian ish ideology. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, there's a couple, there's kind of a couple standout people in, in kind of like that. Well, and it's like all those people are like many, well, I don't know. Like, People were sort of back and forth, but like many of them have come out as like total creeps, yeah. like Linus Torvalds and now Richard Stallman and other folks too. Cause like the, it's like the libertarian thing, like there's other ways it manifests in not so pretty ways. And with Richard Stallman, it was the fact that like maybe pedophilia is not a big deal. <laughs> right, right. <Yeah. laughs> like, like, hey, they said yes. It's like, oh my God. Like it, it's just so ridiculous. Yeah. And then Linus Torvalds, it's like the whole kind of like, well, I can be an asshole. It's just about the work. like. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so that's kind of what I was saying. I was like, you know, I don't know. They're just, it feels like I don't want to get like political about the ideology because the people who are, I like, don't like. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so I don't want to like, there is, I don't know what the disconnect is there, but I don't want to be part of it. You don't want to be just, associated with those, with those people. Right. I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and I think also what I was reflecting on is that for me, it was always open source. Like I started my programming career in R, you know? Yeah. And so there's not really, I wasn't part of like the proprietary world that they were rebelling against. Right. You were part of the revolution. You just benefited from it. I just benefited from it. Yeah. And so, and then I feel like what I see now is not that like everyone developing an open source is like this ideological, like champion. It's just that that's where work happens. And so they work there and they're like competing with each other. Like, it's not like it took away competition or capitalism or whatever. They're like, I don't know. It's hard. It's like, it's almost like back to the stuff about data table and whatever. It's like, these people are still like tearing each other to shreds. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, it's not like this is like, Oh, like everyone's motivated by like wanting to, you know, solve all the world's problems. It's like, I don't know. I think they're still just competing. And now the, now the price is more opaque since it's not money. Right. It, I think I, those, like the people like Richard Stallman and Linus Torvalds, like I think, you know, they came up at a time where everyone in their community was united in in some sense by the idea of open source versus kind of proprietary software like Microsoft and, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there was, there was a sense in which the community was smaller. Uh, I don't know about the actual numbers, but like, you know, because there was this kind of there was a kind of a unifying principle there, or at least at least one. Um, and now, like you said, like now that everyone just kind of uses open source software, the community isn't really united by that anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, right? It, it's, so it's way more heterogeneous. And um, and I think this is this is what happens when you kind of when you kind of win, so to speak, right? It's just mm -hmm. like now, and and I think the same is with R. You know, R is way more the community is way more diverse and heterogeneous than it used to be um and uh and so dealing with that is is like a is always like a difficult transition for i think for any community right mm -hmm. um and um i think one of the i think so i was you know every year i teach my class in, in uh it's called statistical computing and in the first um lecture i talk about well what is open source software what is free software right mm -hmm. and uh, every year that goes by that that part of the lecture feels a little bit more kind of like anachronistic you know <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah right um, and, but one thing that caught my eye this time around um is i talk about you know, so the definition of free software there's four freedoms right and there's like freedom zero uh which is like uh well there's four freedoms and the basically the i'll, I'll get to that in a second and, and the idea is that you need to the source code of of software needs to be available in order to satisfy all the four freedoms. Okay, mm -hmm. um, which I think 
that is super controversial, right? In 1998, mm. right? Right, right. <laughs> but it's like, I mean, it's kind of controversial now. Because it's not like everything is open source software, right? But it's not like, it's not controversial. It's just some companies decide not to do that, right? Right, yeah. Um, and, and, so, and so it's like, you know, you have to make a choice. But it, the, the, the mere idea of it is not controversial anymore. Yeah, right. However, I actually think that, so the, that today the most controversial freedom in the, so, in the kind of like definition of free software is the first one, which is, which is called Freedom Zero. And, it's called, and it says that you have the freedom to use the software for any purpose. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, which mm -hmm. I think is, is super interesting now because I feel like that was like the least controversial, I think, uh, freedom, I think, back in the old days. Because mm -hmm. um, it's like, well, yeah, duh. If you have the software, you should be able to use it for whatever you want, right? Right. Um, but I think that I think if you like that is controversial because I think not that platforms like Twitter or Facebook or whatever are open source software. They're not. I mean, they're not by any definition. But um, but it's like the idea that like you know some like you may be restricted from using software, you know, for certain purposes. I think is more controversial. Perhaps. Yeah, actually, you know, this really reminds me, um, right after 2016 election, um, which we won't discuss, but the, I ran into someone, uh, from Airbnb who was like genuinely distressed. Like I, like, it's hard to explain. I mean, everyone was distressed, but like, like she was genuinely distressed at the idea that open source projects from Airbnb might have been used by like Russians or, you know, by like yeah. whoever. Um, and, and I remember being like, she, she literally was just like, I don't know about this open source thing. Like, <laughs> and I was like, that's a good point. Like, yeah, I would feel like crap if my stuff got used for nefarious purposes, you know? Right. Yeah. And I think, and I think that's kind of hidden in the background of most, open oh, well of really all open source licenses you know mm -hmm. um it's kind of i mean mo like most oh, i would say all proprietary software that you use has a restriction on what you can use it for right i mean mm -hmm. all of it does right it, it says here's what you're allowed to use it for and you can't use it for any other purpose right right um but i think basically all open source licenses allow you to use the software for whatever you want um mm -hmm. and i think most people don't really think about that but i think I think people are thinking about it more now. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's some of the licenses like restrict, you can use it, but in these settings you need to pay. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. AGPL. Yeah. Yeah. So I um, don't know that much about licenses. But I think, you know, the stock boilerplate type licenses that people throw out there for whatever open source packages, I think, uh, you know, they don't really have any restrictions. Right. Um, and I think, the main concern, I think, previously was like you know, to make sure that people understand that there's no warranty, right? Like, so if something goes wrong, they're not liable, right? Um, but uh, I think you know the kinds of software that we're building these days, whether it's artificial intelligence or machine learning, or you know, they it's it's not like a stretch to think, oh, well, they could be used for some nefarious purpose, right? Right. Yeah. I guess you're right, especially with the like facial recognition. Exactly. Right. I mean, I don't know how much. I mean, I don't know how much open source. There's probably there's definitely some open source facial recognition software, right? Mm -hmm. So sure. uh, I, yeah, yeah, I would. Well, maybe not. I don't know. But th I'm sure that you could hack it together with like yeah, crystal. yeah, yeah. But what would be the legal? Let's say someone violate if you have something that's like you cannot use this software to harm people. You know, right? Like, how would you enforce it? Yeah, like what would you sue them? <laughs> like I have the people a, yeah. who harmed. Yeah, I haven't the foggiest idea. I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, aren't most of these licenses untested in court? Um, to, yeah, I think for the most part, I think um, there was. I was funny. I was just looking this up, um, a little while ago. There was a big court case over Linux, though, um, mm. and um, so, but I don't know to what extent it tested the license of, of like the GPL license. I think, um. Mm -hmm. But um, this, these things have come up in court. But I, don't, but I think you're right in the sense that they don't come up very often. But yeah. I, do, I do think like the Free Software Fa Foundation does litigate, you know, instances of you know license violations. They have a whole compliance unit. Uh, um, that's cool. So, but I don't know any details, and, and it's not clear that any details necessarily become public. Yeah, you know who's not going to be into limiting who can use <laughs> the software? Who? 
Richard Stallman. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very explicitly. <laughs> it's also yeah. not into, you know, other laws protecting people. Yeah. We don't have to go down that road. I know. Yeah. But it's just, well, whatever. I mean, it's, I think that's, I'm really glad you said that because that's clarifying where it's like, if you want to be, the only way I would feel comfortable being like, quote unquote, political about open source is if I did like, like that would be an angle that I could get into of like, let's build like do no harm type stuff around open source. And then I would be ideologically departing from Richard Smallman and that whole posse yeah. of people. Cause yeah. it was like someone posted to someone else of like, Oh, like, like this guy too. And it was like, most of his Wikipedia was fine. Then he got to the end and the, he had like gun stuff. It was like bananas. <laughs> and you're just uh, like, oh my Yeah. God. So the, I think the other person that stands out in my mind is Eric Raymond. Uh, yeah. Um, he's the, uh, he's, he's like a super libertarian. Um, and yeah. he, you know, I think it's funny how like our kind of like the, the world changes and something and, like how, when these people, the, you know, our view of, of a lot of these people kind of changes. Yeah. Um, and, um, and it's true. I think like most people who use open source software now, they didn't sign up for all this nonsense. Yeah, you know? exactly. Like I never would have signed up for that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm staunchly anti-pedophilia. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I think hopefully most of our listeners are too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad we talked this out because I couldn't quite wrap my arms around it, but there was just this feeling of like, I don't want to be associated with them. And if being political about open source means that, then I don't want to do it. Right. And right. I feel like I'm just such a pragmatist. Like I see how this stuff is working on the ground with like, again, all these kind of like competitions and like what's motivating people, whatever. And I'm like, this isn't like, this isn't like some sort of like ideological situation. These are just people doing work and this is the new workplace. Right. So, but, but I can get political about wanting to figure out licenses, like, like, <laughs> The do no harm thing. So, you know, it's funny when the whole Richard Stallman thing came up. First of all, I didn't even hear about it. I actually Brian Caffo like notified me of it. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> well, apparently, you don't read the news. <laughs> well, I, I hadn't used Twitter in like two days, and it like it came up during those two days. Um, yeah. But um, it's funny because I hadn't really thought about him at all in like years. You know. I know. Uh, like I feel like you know he. You know, like, the, didn't he die? Well, <laughs> not that he died, but like <laughs> I, the whole open source free software thing is, you know, it's way bigger than him now, obviously. Yeah. Um, and um, so, like, I, I don't know, I didn't really think of him as like a major figure anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think less, and it even, I think he's less relevant in some sense than Lin Linus Torvalds, who still has a lot of active development, or right. had a lot of active development in in the development of Linux kernel. Um, is he still like on leave figuring his stuff out? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I haven't kept close track of that. We just need to release a new New Yorker article every year or so. And then right. that keeps him in the shadows. Because like, right. <laughs> <laughs> if people don't remember, it was like the New Yorker decided to do an article about how abusive he is. Yeah. And like because they were writing the article, he was like, you know what? I think I need to take some time off, and, like reevaluate my life choices. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But he's going to need a lot more. I think he was like, I'll take a few months off. And I'm like, you're going to need 20 years <laughs> yeah, easily. Yeah. Like, I don't, I just, I don't know if he's back. I, I, he yeah. might be back. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. But I mean, the thing that was so disheartening too about the Stallman stuff is like, I feel like I got, I mean, this, like you said, I came in after the revolution, like, like my mom is a mathematician. She faced so much worse sexism than me. Like, and like biostat is a lot of women, you know, the chair of my department was a woman that I think that this, the class was like 50, 50 at least. Yeah. Yeah. It still um, is roughly. Yeah. And so, and then, you know, I've, I mean, I've also like, like the one like credit I give myself is that. And, and, like, growing up in Indiana, it was worse, for sure. Like, I definitely, in my first, like, my freshman class, it was all boys and, like, four, well, all all young men. I don't know what you call 16-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 14. Anyway, <laughs> all boys and then, like, three girls, four girls. And um, it was, like, probably, like, 16 boys and four girls. And then this one guy just, like, 
look back. He's like, well, do you really think it's a coincidence? Yeah. And I was like, I mean, no, but not for the reasons you think. (laughs) (laughs) It was, and that was actually just surprising. Like I was like confused. It was almost like, oh, I've heard tale of this, like people saying stuff like this. Cause growing up, I mean, your, your world's just so different when you grow up with a mom who's a mathematician and you're good at math. Cause it's like, oh, this is what girls do. You know, it's, it's not, it doesn't. Anyway, the point is like, I didn't see the worst of it. And then I've been in these jobs. Like, I do think the credit I give myself is that I do interview for culture. And I think I have like genuinely figured out these like nice bubbles within tech, like Etsy, Stitch Fix. Right. And there's, I don't think it's a coincidence that they're kind of women centric products. Yeah. Whatever. Um, But like the real CS world is like awful. (laughs) (laughs) Like people, everyone knew about Stallman doing this stuff. And like someone tweeted out like, yeah, I was meeting, I was like at a dinner with him and he put his hand on my knee under the table. And like, everyone was like, yeah, that's what he does. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, Oh, Oh my God. It's, and I actually, I know, I know someone who knew like, uh, do you say Linus or Linus? I thought I always thought it was Linus because he's like yeah. you know, from Finland, but yeah, okay. But, well, that guy, like yeah. him doing crazy stuff at party. Like, I realize that I have all these stories of people in like the CS world. I don't know. It seems like I've found the enclave of like nice people. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ugh. Sorry for people who had to experience that. That's awful. Yeah. <laughs> so. Anyway, I just have two more bits of mail slash follow up. Mm-hmm. This will be quick. One is that uh, Martin e- emailed us and mm-hmm. um, about a keyboard. I don't know if you saw Ew. this. Oh no, he said sent it to me. So um, it's the Ergo Docs keyboard. Interesting. Okay. And um, I uh, let me see if I can. I can't really send it to you, but uh. It's um, it's one of these two part keyboards. Nice. Wait, is it heirloom quality? Is it like, is there wood involved? No, okay. no. Sorry. Did I talk about that one last time? I think you did. Yeah, I really yeah. seem to remember it. I'm anyway. not going to get over the heirloom quality. Like, you pass this keyboard on to your grandkids. Like, <laughs> like remember when? As if they're not just going to control everything with like the chip implants in their brain. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, have you seen that Star Trek where it's like, um, what's his name? The um, I think it's the one when they're in San Francisco. Oh, okay. No, I haven't seen that. It's a uh, oh, so good. Anyway, it's one of the movies, and um, so they're like going back to the eighties and so. Oh Francisco. yeah, okay. I think that's like Star Trek Four. I, I yeah, yeah, I think you're right. That yeah. sounds like right. Anyway, that was of course that's like everyone who actually likes Star Trek was like their least favorite movie. Right, right. But it's yeah. my most favorite movie. But there's this scene when like Scotty is like trying to like work with a computer, <laughs> and he's like, "Have I already told you this?" Joke? No, no, I don't think so. so he, he like goes up to the computer. He's like, "Hello, computer," and then they're like, "No, no, no!" Like, use the mouse. So they hand him the mouse, and then he like picks up the mouse and like says into it, "Hello, computer." <laughs> 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 he says it. They're like, "Hello, computer," and then it's like they're like, "Oh, no, no, just use the keyboard." And he's like, "Oh." How quaint. And then just like type, type, type. <laughs> anyway, it just reminds me of that. Like, like it, it'll be like Scotty. It's like, give it to your grandkids. They're right. like, how quaint. You're right. <laughs> um, I just sent you the link to the uh, keyboard. Yes. Link, yes. Um, I see. The uh, last piece here is we always have to end with uh, some sort of milk related discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, but Maxime Tur- Turgeon, I'm going to say, uh, it says, I live in ca- in the Canadian prairies where we proudly produce canola oil. And I can't for the life of me understand the hate in the last two episodes. What's going on? Is it just that oh. you don't want to pour any oil in your coffee? So what's wrong with canola oil? I guess I have my reason, but maybe you have a different one. I don't think I now my heart is broken oh. that <laughs> I've like offended canola oil producers. <laughs> well, I was just my feeling was just like it just it just feels weird, but I don't have a problem with canola oil. <laughs> you know, like just... I had a problem with canola oil. Canola oil. I think actually, I think this is like a sad correlation situation. Okay. 
where it's like usually canola oil is produced like low low grade oil like it's not high quality oh okay i guess i I didn't know that well it's like it's like the most it's probably like the easiest to produce it's like industrial grade canola oil. It's like a thing in my head. I don't actually have any facts whatsoever on this. <laughs> but it's like if you go to like McDonald's or something, like the oil they're using there is not like high quality. Like they're not like, give me the best oil you have. Like, please put it through the filter five times. Like, I, I don't know how oil is produced, but however, whatever the worst possible, like barely scraping by version is, is what McDonald's is using. But my understanding is that, at least in the past, I don't know what's going on right now. In the past, the oil that you're thinking about is soybean oil. Mm. Uh, that is like the industrial cooking oil, like hmm. one step above what you might put into your car. <laughs> well, yeah, no, exactly. It's like it's like, do you put it into your car or your body? Like that's like right. where it's bad. Well, I don't know. It's like it's like the like the big vats of canola oil you can get like at the grocery. Yeah. I, like I in my head those are equivalent but they're only in my head that way because someone told me that like someone who's a chef you know so I'm like okay yeah I'll buy it so <laughs> now I feel bad because like it's probably not the product it's like the association of the product okay with like so anyway the point is I should wheel back my <laughs> your canola oil yeah comments and as i said they make a big point on the oatly thing of saying that canola oil is like is this is good canola oil like it's yeah there's some sort of acid like a high like low acid content oil or i can't remember how they phrase it but (laughs) so again not knowing anything those seem like the right buzzwords to add to canola oil to make it seem good so to me it just kind of like sounds weird but to like be mixing oil with this I do agree with that. Uh, like, but like that's just kind of like the extent at which, you know, <laughs> I maybe disagree with it. Yeah, I do. I, I had a friend once who said that her like uncle or someone would like take a shot of olive oil every day. Oh. <laughs> to like keep his levels. You know when people talk about like their levels? Yeah. <laughs> I, like, <laughs> I have no clue. It seems like a risky proposition. I thought all of those would be good for you. Like, well, yeah, this... but would you take a shot of it? Yeah, maybe not. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, same with coconut oil. People eat that like as that like just like eat a gob of coconut oil. It's <laughs> yeah, good for you. I wouldn't yeah. do that. Oh. No. Yeah. So yeah, I guess you're right. Just like the thought of drinking oil is probably what you know. Yeah, it just doesn't feel right. Doesn't feel right. And then if you think about if you have this bad association with canola oil of like it's like cheap and poorly processed right you know on top of that but but like yeah i i feel bad now so yeah thank you for writing in i'm I'm glad that the canola oil um representatives are listening (laughs) i should actually like learn any of this firsthand like like i should do some google research and come back next time okay there will be a a more critical (laughs) follow-up i for whatever reason i'm on an oatly kick now like i'm drinking it every day all right. Multiple times a day. I don't know what happened. The weather's changed. It's colder. Yeah, it feels more. You know, this is like when I start eating oatmeal. You know, exactly. So it's yeah. just like an OD season. An OD. Yeah. No, I definitely. I I, gave, I told the the barista near me. I was like, I. There will not be consistency. I'm accepting that there's not going to be a consistent requests from me. Like sometimes it'll be oat milk. Sometimes it'll be regular. Just deal. I'm not. I'm not just someone who I walk up and you have it ready. Like I'm going to need to make a game time decision. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what does the barista say? <laughs> They're like, "Why are you talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> who are you?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they just have to like be nice to everyone. Yeah, it's kind of it's their job. Tough. Actually, you know, another thing with robot coffee quickly is that actually the the barista who i talked to the most at this blue bottle he was like employee eight at blue bottle whoa um yeah because i mean i'm like i'm at like one of the first like the hayes valley i mean they have an espresso named hayes valley like it's this is like the one of the first blue bottles and um he'd been working for a long time and he he just like is he's leaving and he was like 
my hands hurt so much. I'm like, I'm so tired. And I was like, oh no, I didn't really, I mean, of course they do. And that makes me want robot coffee more because I don't want my like favorite barista to be physically disabled from the coffee. So it is tiring. Like if you, it, like, I think if it's if, like a typical shop, might a shop might go through like, I don't know, 250 espressos in a day or something like that. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. uh, if you're like the one person who has to make them all, it is, it's like, it's stressful on the body. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this place that I really like cafe X, it's interesting. Cause like, it's not like the, you know, like basically they're like, let's keep people around, but just do the customer service. So like the robot makes the coffee and it's just, I, I mean, someone was like, I don't get the startup. It's just these coffee machines. I'm like, yeah, but with like good coffee in it and like organic milk and Oatly. And, and then the people who work there are like actually talking to you and not physically exhausted. Like I was talking to one of the guys there and he was like, yeah, I used to work at Starbucks. And like, by the end of the day, you're so exhausted Whereas here I'm not, and like I can actually talk to people. And right. Versus another robot coffee startup is just almost like a vending machine. Like there's no people at all. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I actually think I like the kind of like the robots there. You get to see an industrial robot doing like intricate work, which is kind of fun. And then they're still humans. So it's not just like you're like, I think there's Cafe X strikes the right balance of like some. Humans are there for the human part. It's like That's Stitch right. Fix. Yeah. Like, keep the human touch. But Exactly. 